So I think we'll get started. Good afternoon and welcome to this week's NDARC webinar. My name's Sarah Feinbeck and I'm a researcher here at NDARC and I'm also your chair and host for this afternoon's webinar. Okay, so this week marks the International Overdose Awareness Day. This is a special day and it aims to raise awareness about overdose reduce stigma surrounding, surrounding drug-related deaths and promote actions that reduce harms associated with drug use. So I just want to acknowledge this day and show my support and also to acknowledge all people that have been touched by preventable causes, including overdose. So I also pay my respect to the traditional custodians of the land from where we're all joining from today. I join, I'm joining you today from Ngunnawal and Nambri lands and it's a beautiful sunny day here. Um, and I would also like to show my respect for elders past, present and emerging, and in particular, welcome any First Nations people joining us today. Okay, so today we're going to be hearing about translated and culturally adapted digital screening tools for Aboriginal, for alcohol and other drug use in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today our speaker, Dr. Matthew Stevens, who is an early career researcher at the University of Adelaide. Since completing his PhD in 2021, Matthew has worked at the University of Adelaide School of Biomedicine on several research and teaching projects under the guidance of Associate Professor Rob Ali, AO, who many of you will know. Matt's research is focused on screening and early intervention for behavioural and substance use addictive disorders in a variety of health and welfare settings. After Matt has talked, he'll be joined as a panel discussion as usual um, by our good friend, Professor Kylie Lee, who is now the Professor of Public Health and leads the Priority Populations Research Stream at the Centre for Alcohol Policy Research at La Trobe University. Kylie leads a program of work in the field of alcohol and other drugs, drug use amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations and other priority populations. And I know that Kylie has done a lot of work in this space, so we'll have a lot to contribute to today's discussion. So as usual, after, after Matt has finished his talk, we'll have a Q&A session. So please start putting your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get through as many as we can after the talk. We'll try and, yeah, we'll try and get through them all. Okay, I will get out of your way, and I'll ask Matt to please turn on his mic and camera. Hello, welcome. Looks good. G'day. Okay, over to you. Brilliant. So you can see my screen, everything's all good? Everything all right, looks sweet. great, thanks. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Stevens. Um, as mentioned, I'm an early career senior research fellow at the University of Adelaide. Um, and today's discussion is gonna be framed around a new digital app that we've been developing in partnership with community called the Pitanjara Assist. For some reason. There we go. But first, let me just begin by paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the ancestral lands that were gathered on today, in my case here in Ghana country in Adelaide, also a beautiful sunny day, um, and just acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship felt by community to the land, country and waterways, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Today's talk is going to be a little bit different to uh, an approach that you're probably used to with these sorts of presentations. And I appreciate that there is a mixture of backgrounds and expertise in the audience. Um, and while I am a researcher and I love talking about research and I love talking about methodologies and, you know, data analysis and all of that sort of thing, I appreciate that it's not really everyone's cup of tea and that's probably not really that important for everybody or fun for everybody here. So what I'm going to try to do today is tell you a story or rather walk you alongside me on a journey. And this is going to be a major theme of today's discussion is journeys. The journey we'll walk through is through the lens of a participant through our research project, our current research project. And at every step, we'll discuss what's involved in the project, what's involved in the process. But I'm also going to use it as an opportunity to sort of pull back the curtain on many aspects of the research project in terms of the design and method and why we decided decided to do the things that we did and all of those pain points that led us there along the way. And rather shamelessly, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to show off our app because we are all really proud of it. But first, 
a quick bit of background, a little bit of a primer so that you aren't sort of completely going in blind on this. Two questions, what are we doing and why is it important? Well, first and foremost, the research project that I'm going to be talking about and we're going to walk through today involves validating a new digital screening tool called the Pitanjara Assist. And the reason that we're doing this is primarily because while there are several screening tools available, there is currently a need for screening tools that are available in language, that are culturally sensitive and appropriate, that are designed with and by community, that are able to, to assess a variety of uh, harms along the spectrum of risk, and also to uh, able to assess a variety of substances as well, not just the primary drug of concern. But like any good story, let's start in the middle and fill in some details along the way. I want you to imagine that you are an Anangu man or woman fluent in Pitanjara, and you're visiting a health worker that you regularly see, and they approach you asking you whether you would be interested in hearing about a research project. And essentially, they tell you that they've developed this new app, and they want to see if your drinking, smoking, and other drug use is maybe putting you at a bit of risk, and they want to know, essentially, if it works the way that it's meant to. And so you say, yes, please, tell me more. So the journey begins. The health worker then proceeds to do something with the iPad. They mention something about being randomized. What is that all about? At this point, you might say, hang on, what are we randomizing? Is this an RCT? What, what is this? But before anything happens in our study, the health worker or research assistant who is collecting the data will need to randomize participants. What are we randomizing? In this case, we're randomizing the instrument order. Participants will either be asked to complete the Pitanjara Assist app first, or they'll be asked to undergo an interview before a short break and then completing the other. The purpose of being randomized in this study is to sort of change up the order in which participants receive the app or the interview. We've done this by building a custom algorithm into our own website, which gives us more flexibility and control over the randomization sequence. Rather than each site having its own randomization sequence, it occurs at the global study level. So the research assistant would see the current screen that you see in front of you now, and they would click the green button to randomize. So we'll click that. And sure enough, you've been randomly allocated to the group which completes the assist app first. But this begs the question as to why. Why do we need to randomize? Well, the main reason is to reduce the question order bias. Sometimes our answers to question one of some instrument inform how we respond to question two because we like to be coherent in our responses. For our study though, because we're doing a validation study, which I'll talk to you more, we want our answers to in uh, section one to be completely independent of how we answer those sections in, in, in section two. It also helps us to avoid participant fatigue. But back to the journey. Now you're given an iPad and it looks like this. The health worker then passes you a set of headphones, which you pop on. And in this section, you're asked to do two things. First, you're asked to learn about the study, what's involved, the risks and benefits of participation, all of these things. And you're also asked to create a unique participant code. Hang on, what is a unique participant code? It's a six digit ID code that is a concatenation of letters and numbers, which allows us researchers to track participants through various stages of the research without needing to collect identifiable information like names, email addresses, phone numbers, dates of birth, etc. It's self-generated by the participant and it's based on their answers to one of uh, each of four questions. It's then generated automatically and stored automatically. So there's no need for you as the participant or we, the research team, to remember them. Well, why do we need this? Well, as I sort of alluded to before, it makes your data anonymous, which is ultimately safer for you and safer for us. It means that there's no real risk of identification. If someone was to hack the database, they would need to know a fair bit about you to be able to identify whether that data belonged to you or not. And as I said before, we, the research team, are completely blind during the study. When the time comes that we go to analyze the data, we've got different databases. So we'll pull the data from each database and match them using that unique code. It will then convert it to a, a serialized participant ID, uh, in other words, participant one, two, three, et cetera, and we'll destroy those unique codes. But you might be wondering, 
hang on, that relies on participants giving accurate answers across each stage. And yes, that is certainly the case. It does. In our study, we've taken the decision that if, say, three or four of the answers are identical, then we will assume it's the same person. And if, for example, two out of four of the answers are the same, but the age and the gender are also the same, then we might use that as an, um, an indicator that it may be the same person as well. So how does the creation of this code all work? Well, step one, you're handed the tablet. Looks like this. Step two, you indicate where you're completing this assessment. All sites are listed and labeled clearly in that drop-down box. Step three, you then fill in your responses to a series of drop-down boxes. And after you've done that, as you can see, the participant information uh, button becomes available to you. And you can move on to learning more about the study and providing consent. Once you've created your unique ID, you're then guided through an interactive process of consent. And the first thing to note is that the page is separated into individual sections. If I click the icon, the little the play icon there, it reads the section aloud to me, in this case, in English. Let me demonstrate. What is the project about? We have developed this app so that people can read and listen to the assist questions, then choose their answers. The app guides you through questions and tells you the results of your checkup. The app also provides information to help keep you safe. This information can be read by anyone who is having problems with alcohol, smoking or other drug use, or a member of their family or health workers. The app is used on an iPad and all the information can be read and listened to in English or written down. Great. So you can listen to any or all of those sections as you choose. Clicking that little plus icon expands the text so you can read that as well. And once you're happy, you sort of scroll down to the bottom of the page like so. You get all the way down the bottom and you check the little I agree to participate box, which enables the I agree button for you to select. Clicking that allows you to proceed with the journey. So let's zoom out a little bit and take stock of what we know so far. So far, you've had a little bit of a play with the app. You've listened to all the details about what's involved in the study, which has ultimately informed you enough to provide consent to participate. But for the benefit of those who maybe haven't had the opportunity to listen to all of those steps, let me summarize for you. This study that we're undertaking involves three components. Component one and two is screening for substance-related risk of harm using this new app that we've developed as well as a diagnostic interview, the order in which will be randomized. At some sites, there is also an independent clinical evaluation that will take place, and we'll discuss that more in detail later. And then the third phase, finally, is a final retest of the app after about seven days. Your specific journey so far has involved, one, being randomized or randomly assigned, rather, to complete the app component first, and then two, you were given the tablet and some headphones and asked to create your unique code and participant uh, code, which you've done. And now it's time for us to complete the remainder of the app. So let's set the gender here. Once you've given consent, the next screen that appears is as displayed and you hear the following. I am female, male. Now you decide in this instance that you identify as male, so you're going to select male. And the purpose of setting the gender here is that it sets the gender of the voice that is available through the remainder of the app, as well as the gender of the graphics that are displayed throughout. But if you notice up the top, there are additional buttons which say language text, language voice. So you decide out of curiosity to click the language text button on the left and select Pitanjara from the drop down. And then the following happens. I am female, male. So you decide, okay, let me click the language voice button and select Pitanjara and see what happens. Brilliant. So what have we learned here? Well, what we've learned is that you can disaggregate the language that you hear and the text that you read. So if you maybe have a preference for one language or the other, or you were just curious like I was, or you might struggle a bit with the text or have hearing issues. You can listen in one language and read in the other or listen in the same language and read in the same language. 
what we've tried to do throughout this entire process is make things as accommodating for as possible for everyone. But carrying on with the journey, you decide to reset things back to English and carry on. Some of this begs the question, though, what is the purpose of matching the participants' gender? Well, it's culturally appropriate for women to speak with women about sensitive issues, women's business, and men to speak with men about men's business, respectively. And you also might be wondering, what about the other genders? Well, at this stage, we took the app out into focus groups and they suggested to us that ultimately this would cause a lot of confusion initially. So it was better to focus on the two, gen the two primary genders first and then scale up from there. So now that you've set the gender and you've addressed a couple of other demographic questions at the front end, you're on to completing the assist in Pitanjara. So what is the assist? Well, the assist stands for the alcohol smoking and substance involvement screening test. It's a brief eight item questionnaire that screens for risky use of all drugs, legal and illegal, as well as illegal or misuse of legal drugs or prescription medications. It takes generally about five minutes to administer and it can be self-completed. It's valid for self-completion. It was developed for primary healthcare, but has since been modified and shaped to a variety of different healthcare settings as well including emergency departments and antenatal clinics or more rapid, rapid turnover settings, as well as younger populations and in older populations too. Importantly though, for the purposes of this study, it was designed to be cross-culturally neutral so that translation from English into other languages was possible and actually made sense. So it was commissioned by the WHO who ultimately wanted something that could be a truly global tool. Now, how is the Pitanjara assist different? Well, there's several ways in which it differs. But first, it only focuses on five key drugs, alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, methamphetamine, and inhalants. And one of the questions, which we'll discuss later, has been split into components, though the scoring algorithm hasn't changed. And whereas the assist steps sequentially through each drug for each question, the Pitanjara assist steps through each question for each drug. The benefit is that then people can focus on a series of questions for a single drug before moving on to the next substance, rather than maybe trying to attribute different things to each drug. The trade-off is obviously that it takes a little bit longer, and pilot testing has indicated to us that that can be about seven minutes from start to finish, although there's quite a degree of variability depending on how much time the person wants to actually engage in using the app. How did we translate the instrument? Well, regular process of WHO translation involves forwards and backwards translation from English into the target language and then back using independent translators at every step and using a Delphi process to settle disagreements, ultimately to kind of arrive at this working translation that makes sense. But that didn't really work for us in this study. In this study, we needed an, in, uh, an additional step. So what we did was translate from English into a less formal English which then facilitated forwards and backwards translation into Pitanjara. And this is so that the translations actually made sense because many of the concepts in Pitanjara and indeed all Aboriginal languages are not immediately translatable to English. They don't tend to make sense and vice versa. So what does the Pitanjara assist actually do? Well, exactly like the, same, the, the regular assist, the purpose of it, the assist, the Pitanjara assist is to assess risk of harm, give you a score, a statement of risk, and then ideally connect you to a purpose-built brief intervention. So tell you what your score is and what you should sort of do about it in order to reduce your level of risk. It's, as I said before, it's based on the assist, but what we've done is add modifications to it to improve the user experience and the interpretability of many of the questions. What are those interpretability features that we've added? Well, as I, as I alluded to before, we've included some visual components. These were designed by a prominent South Australian Aboriginal graphic artist, Blue Goanna. And we've also included additional audio components, which you've some of which you've heard already. So let's pick up where we left off. From when you were young, think about which of the substances you have ever tried. Cigarettes alcohol, marijuana, ice, inhalants. You may recall that previously 
we mentioned something about some of the questions having been split up. What was that all about? Well, question four of the assist, which normally asks, have you experienced health, social, legal, financial problems in the past three months because of your use of drug XYZ? which when we took it out to community was suggested that that is a bit unwieldy conceptually. So what we've done then and what was recommended to us was that we split that section up into four parts, one section for health, one question for social problems, one question for legal difficulties and one question for financial problems. Each of those items has its own graphics, which aid the interpretation of what's going on and examples and prompts as well. And each is then rated either yes, no, or sometimes. Though these items aren't scored, there's a scoring item afterwards which asks how often have these things been happening to you in the past three months. Again, that begs the question of why actually are we disaggregating items if they're not scored? Well, for us, it helps us tailor the brief intervention. The beauty of digital tools, digital screening tools like this, is that it allows us to use computer memory and storage to hold a large volume of possible user journeys. So we can apply one that fits comfortably with what the individual is experiencing at that point of time. If the person says to us, I'm having um, you know, health problems, then we can provide a video that uniquely captures that, that, that's relevant to them. Or if they say that I'm having financial problems, but not problems at home, then we can have a video that that uniquely describes that to them. So we can tailor the, the, the intervention, so to speak. And why the different response types? Well, again, when we took it out to focus group testing, it showed us that if you give the people, if you give people a choice and force them to say either yes or no, many will say no. But if you give people an option to report sometimes, that can be a way for people to actually say yes without saying a strong committed yes. So back to the journey, you go through the assessment and you reach the following screen, which displays my feedback. For each drug that you have said you've used, in which case, for our example, we've said tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis, you get given an assist score and a level of risk. Here we can see that it's low risk tobacco use, moderate risk alcohol use, and high risk cannabis or marijuana use. When we start to interrogate each of those sections, we see the following what your score is, as depicted by a number and a corresponding risk dial, what your score means, which involves essentially a statement of risk, and some of the, the issues or problems that you might be experiencing given that current level of use. And those will depend on the severity of use. Low risk use tends to have a lot fewer problems, but some of the more common ones, whereas higher risk use tends to have the full spectrum of problems, including the more or less common ones, but more severe. Now, anyone who's familiar with the ASSIST and the ASSIST link brief intervention will know that the English version is very medical and very long and very focused on problems. And we obviously really wanted to avoid that approach. We didn't want to take a deficits or problems-based focus. We wanted to take a bit more of a strengths-based approach. So we really cut down this section. But taking a strengths-based approach is really difficult without actually knowing the individual that's in front of you. It's hard to do digitally like this. So we're in the process of developing a web-based uh, intervention, which I spoke to sort of before, which is includes a series of talking to camera videos with different use, user journeys that leverages off that sort of strengths-based approach. That's a, a work in progress, and I can describe that later. When people click Next, on the feedback section, they're given a small bit of advice about what they should do to reduce their risk. This is not designed to replace a brief intervention. It's instead designed to be a launch pad into a discussion with a health worker or a health professional about a brief uh, about ways to reduce risk. And like I said, while we're validating the app itself, we're in the process of developing this intervention, but we need to make sure that the questionnaire component is actually valid first. So you can see here that the advice that the person gets depends on their current level of use. For low risk use, it's basically don't escalate. For moderate risk, which this is, it's look, consider maybe cutting down or stopping. And for higher risk use, it's look, let's have a chat about maybe thinking about, you know, ways that we can get some additional support. And then finally, you've now had a bit of a play with the, the app. You've, you've, you've received your feedback about your substance use. And the app asks you to rate 
provide your feedback back to the app about a series of acceptability measures using a standard sort of emoji face like at scale rating system ranging notionally from very bad to very good. And you can see there's four questions there. And then that completes the assist screening section of the study. So the research assistant or the health worker would then hand you a $30 voucher uh, for Coles or Woolworths, um, non-redeemable for alcohol and tobacco, and say thank you for participating and give you a short break. So let's take stock of where we are and where we've been in our journey. First, we've been randomized, then we completed the assist app, which included setting our participant code, giving consent, completing the instrument, exploring our feedback, and then giving some feedback of our own. Cool, what's next in the study? Well, like I said, a short break, and then it's time for the diagnostic interview. I think right now would be a really handy time to hand over to Kylie to see if there was any uh, reflections that you might have. Hey, Matt. <laughs> hey. I forgot I was coming in now, but oh, thank, that's you for okay. asking. thank you for asking me to come in now. And I loved how you mentioned pain points at the start. Um, I totally feel you in terms of the um, the pain and the pleasure of creating an app, but in a research context. I think um, it's really interesting to see to see how the app's progressing. It's really exciting. And, and you and um, Rob have just done a, a beautiful job. Um, it's really great to see other examples of app technology or app tech being used to, you know, create different pathways. So, you know, you see this if you're a guy, you see this if you're a woman. Um, mm -hmm. And where you can have those accompanying images, it's so nice to be able to, you know, really utilise that sort of um, functionality for um, to make it easier for people as well. I've got other stuff, Matt, but I'm wondering, do you want me to keep going on or should I save some stuff for later? Maybe save some stuff. We'll, we'll jump back to it at the end. See you soon. No worries. Okay. So we've had our short break. Now it's on to the interview. So the diagnostic interview, what's that all about? Well, as you obviously gathered from now, we're trying to validate this new app that you've had a look at and had a play with. And we want to know, does it measure what we think it measures? And that is to say, we think, like the regular assist, that it captures a continuum of use, substance use, that ranges from non-problematic to highly problematic or dependent use. But in order to know for sure, we need an external reference point, which everyone agrees is a gold standard. And that means we need to do a clinical assessment in the form of a diagnostic interview. In this study, we're using the DISSAM clinical interview, which is based on both the SCID and the MINI. And the reason we're using it is it provides a clinical diagnosis for three types of ICD-11 diagnosis, hazardous, harmful use and dependence, as well as DSM-5 substance use disorder, so either mild, moderate or severe. But given the population and what we spoke about before in terms of concepts and translatability and languages, is the interview even valid? Well, studies have shown that the SCID is valid for English-speaking First Nations populations, and the interview we'll be using is based on, on that um, interview. But we've sort of adopted a slightly different approach that it, uh, involves a bit more of a yarning style, semi-structured interview that's based on this DISSAM interview, but it has the flexibility for clarifying language and concepts as necessary. That obviously brings about challenges, but it's a trade-off that I think is necessary or we feel is necessary in this case. We've done some things to mitigate that. First, we've included a translator for every interview and that translator is familiar with the concepts of the diction, is trained in the administration of the interview and understands the diagnostic criteria. And therefore they'll be useful in actually being able to translate any concepts and meaning from that um, perspective without losing the meaning that's associated with it. But it is important to recognize that we are kind of traversing the unknown a little bit here. So particularly with the new classification systems, ICD-10, DSM-4, there's a lot more options and a lot more freedom out there, but we're choosing to focus on the newer classification systems, which means we have less room to move. However, one of the major strengths of the approach that I think we're taking here, I think is a major strength, is the inclusion of an independent clinical evaluation, which will occur for all of those taking part in this study at DAS's withdrawal services, and which will be done by an addiction medicine doctor registrar who is blind 
to the outcome from the earlier assessments. They're just coming in and giving their clinical opinion on ICD and DSM diagnoses. This, I think, will help us mitigate some of the potential issues. But let's get back to the journey. So you get handed the tablet once more, and this is the screen you're faced with. It's a red cap survey. And again, you need to scroll to the bottom, click I agree to continue, and then create your unique code once more before handing the tablet back to the research assistant or the health worker for the interview. Some of you will be wondering why we're collecting this information again, isn't it redundant? Well, participant codes, obviously, so that we can match data because the databases are different, okay? The reason we're ca capturing consent again is simply because it's easier for us logistically. Other, if, if we were to do it the other way, we would need to develop parallel versions of the interview and parallel versions of the app, which either have or don't have the consent page at the front. Anyone who's tried to do this you know, in terms of a research design knows that adding in degrees of freedom here creates um, potential frictions, but also anyone who's ever worked with an app developer before will know that that is a costly exercise and one we're sort of keen to avoid. So we think this is a, 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 an okay solution. So you sit down with the health worker and the translator and you go through the interview questions. All of the data from the study are collected digitally even the interview, so it's all built in REDCap. REDCap is the um, the Uni Adelaide University's preferred partner. You may be familiar with REDCap or Qualtrics, same sort of thing. It opens up the flexibility of being able to structure questions, organize question logic, so you can filter out questions which are or aren't relevant. The whole interview process should take between 20 and 30 minutes, depending on the level of substance involvement. Um, if the person has hasn't used substance, a particular substance in the past 12 months, we're not interested in that. It's only the past 12 months that we're really interested in. The whole interview takes uh, is, is three sections, series a series of questions related to alcohol, then a series of questions related to tobacco, and then finally a series of questions related to other drugs. But remember, we're only looking at cannabis, ice, and inhalants as well. After the um, point where you've gone through the interview, you've finish the interview, you're done, you get reimbursed another $30 for your time. Let's pretend for a second that you're currently undergoing managed withdrawal at DAS's quarantine facility at Glenside here in South Australia. And you've spoken with Mark, who's our uh, one of our CIs and research assistant here, who's approached you about the study and administered the interview. And now Mark heads out, calls one of the doctors and hands them the tablet. The doctor is an addiction medicine registrar, as we've spoken before. He's already familiar with you as a patient of the service. And she is then asked to provide an independent assessment of your history of dependence and ICD-11 diagnoses and DSM-5 substance use disorder diagnoses. And like we mentioned before, they don't know the outcome of the earlier assessments. They're just asked to provide their opinion on whether or not you meet the criteria or not. And we're only taking this approach at the withdrawal service, presumably because you would more likely to have had a history of dependence or higher risk use at these sites, hence the need to seek um, managed withdrawal compared to elsewhere in the general population. We're really just trying to target that higher risk end. And after all that, you've now completed the first part of the study. So all that's left is to make contact with the health worker again whenever you're at the service or at the site and you'll be asked to completely assist again within potentially seven days so we can test it once more. But let if you'll indulge me, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about our approach to analysing the information and hopefully we can then tie a few loose threads together. Now that you know what's involved from your perspective as the participant, let's take a look at what we're actually looking to achieve from our end scientifically. First, by doing the assist, we're assessing feasibility and acceptability and internal consistency reliability of the app. In layman's terms, it's is this app something that we can implement that isn't burdensome, that doesn't take too long? Is it something that's welcome by its intended, intended audience? And do the individual items for each substance address the same underlying construct, which we think is risk of harm? By doing the diagnostic interview, we're establishing a gold standard reference point, which we'll use to assess whether the assist in pit and jar is valid in terms of concurrent and discriminant validity, as well as diagnostic accuracy. Really, we just want to know, does it measure what we think it measures? 
And the independent clinical evaluation is an additional guardrail for helping us to make that judgment. And then finally, by getting participants to do the assessment once more, seven days or so apart, we can assess the test retest reliability. Concurrent validity is the extent to which scores on some instrument align with scores on another instrument, which is considered the gold standard. So we'll assess that in two ways. First, by regressing scores from the assist for each substance versus the number of diagnostic symptoms reported during that interview for each substance. And we're expecting those scores to increase linearly. Secondly, we're looking at how the probability of reaching a diagnosis of dependence or severe substance use disorder changes as a function of the assist score. So we're expecting that the assist scores, as the assist score increases, the probability will start to converge towards one. Looking at concurrent validity in the first example to demonstrate assist scores on the y-axis, the vertical axis, or and the, sorry, the number of DSM-5 or could be ICD-11 symptoms along the x-axis, along the bottom. You can see that as we go from left to right, as the number of symptoms increases along the x-axis, we're expecting that the average distribution of assist scores will increase as well. So that's looking to us like a relationship there between symptoms and scores. Similarly, with the second measure, looking at assist scores along the bottom and the probability of a positive diagnosis along the side, the y-axis, we can see that low assist scores, the probability is zero. And as the scores increase, the probability sort of moves towards one. This is simulated data and it's just designed to be a demonstration. It's not an expert. It's, it's not, you know, going to be cl as clear as this, but this is just sort of showing you what we're sort of hoping to, to see. The second thing we're really interested in is discriminant validity, um, which on the other hand sort of measures the extent to which an instrument is able to differentiate between groups which are theoretically different or, or independent is the term. And it's measured in two ways. We're, we're measuring that in two ways, using both, both ways using one-way analysis of variance. We're looking at whether the distribution of scores, specifically their measures of central tendency, means and standard deviations, are different depending on how they're grouped based on the diagnosis. So for example, looking at this violin plot here, you can see along the x-axis at the bottom, you have the independent groups, i.e. where a participant falls based on their number of DSM-5 symptoms for each substance, either no disorder, mild would be two to three symptoms, moderate is four to five, and six plus is severe. So depending on the number of symptoms they report, they'll fall into one of those buckets. And we're looking at the distribution of scores along the y-axis. And we expect that they will be significant differently, uh, significantly different, and that they will increase in a linear fashion as displayed here. The other important set of indices that we're really keen on, on identifying is a diagnostic accuracy. And it's important to remember that this is a screening tool. It's not a diagnostic tool. So while we are expecting it to have utility, we aren't expecting it to be perfect. Step one in the process is to calculate the number of true and false positives and negatives. Trueness is based on the interview. Um, and the false and the positive negative aspect is based on the assist score. So a true positive would be someone who scores high risk on the assist and dependent or severe substance use disorder based on the interview. Similarly, a false positive would be someone who scores high risk on the assist, but in actual fact was not dependent based on the interview. So we calculate those true false positives, negatives. And with these, then we can calculate a bunch of other performance metrics, including sensitivity, specificity, PPV and NPV rock curves as well, which will help us to establish the cutoff scores. Rock curves are essentially a measure of sensitivity along the y-axis and one minus specificity along the x. And then from there, you plot how the sensitivity changes as a function of the increase in the one minus the specificity rate. I'm not going to go into too much detail in case you get bored, but you're basically trying to maximize the sensitivity and specificity there. We're also interested in likelihood ratios and clinical utility indices. I can talk about them in a minute. Um, or we can just leave that for another time. And lastly, for this little section, we're also interested in a couple of things. We're looking at test retest reliability. So does the, does my scores today predict scores tomorrow or in seven days time? Uh, is it culturally acceptable with the target audience? You've seen those questions that we're interested. And the feasibility, which we're assessing based on the time taken to complete the actual assist component of the app. So where are we at now with it? Well, we have ethics from our three main ethics bodies. We've trained our research staff in terms of the protocol. So they know how to do the, the actual study protocol. They know how to administer the, the diagnostic interview as well. 
And Rob and I yesterday went to DAS's Glenside service and we trained the addiction medicine registrars. We gave them a refresher on ICD-11 and DSM-5 diagnostic criteria and coding. And you'd be surprised at how quickly that information is lost. Um, and right now we're out in the community pilot testing just to see if there's any bugs with the app or if there's any bugs in our process, something that can be streamlined. In a couple of weeks, we're really hoping that touch wood, there's no issues and we can be full steam ahead with the validation. So finally, let me just leave you with some acknowledgements because this is a huge team effort of which I'm just speaking to today, but you know, it would not be possible without all of these people here. And with that, I will open up the floor to some questions or comments or hand it over to uh, Sarah or Kylie. Thanks, Matt. What a beautifully thought out and presented talk. I really enjoyed um, how you put that together and, and told us that story. That was really fantastic. Thanks for taking the time to, to make it interesting and fun. Um, yeah, I just want to invite Kylie to turn her camera on and maybe we'll start with you, Kylie, because I know a lot of your work previously is um, similar on the, you know, doing some work on the Grog survey and things. So maybe did you want to kick us off with a couple of reflections? Yeah, sure, Sarah, and well done, Matt. Really beautiful. Um, I I loved the the meta journey that you took us on. Um, yeah. I think one thing I really reflected when when Matt was talking is about how we're taking something really sensitive to ask about. Um, we know that lots of studies even saying that clinicians find it hard to ask people um, about the alcohol and other drug use and how it feels like you're getting in too close. Um, as well. So how you're taking something really sensitive, but using the available technology to just be that launching pad, you know, to kind of get people thinking and ultimately to hopefully get them that initial brief intervention so that then they can, um, they can get help um, elsewhere in the service. I know from the experience of the, the, the Grog app and the, the drug app that we're currently doing, that's kind of meant you know, working out how you can create safe places for people mm -hmm. to tell their story. So I kind of favour the, the the story like Matt's doing with his journey over a survey kind of thing. Um, but even kind of going down to, you know, having no hard edges on the, on the buttons and really soft landings to kind of gentle mm -hmm. ways to get people... Um, identifying or wanting to tell us if they if they use particular drugs particularly injecting drug use which is even kind of harder to to ask about mm -hmm. um i i'd be interested later to hear you talk about the the brief intervention components matt um as well in the latest version we've been looking at sort of meshing together the Pat Dudgeon, Professor Pat Dudgeon's social and emotional well-being model with, um, I know you guys use frames, we use flags, so feedback, mm -hmm. listen, advice, goals and strategies, but kind of meshing it so you've got more connection points to give people feedback about their drinking or drug use, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So the the traditional way that WHO and the, the Western world does it is by getting me to reflect on, Kylie, if you keep using, then these this is how it might harm your body. Mm -hmm. um, or you might get into drink driving accidents and that kind of stuff. Um, but what Professor Pat's looking at is kind of, you know, how can we broaden that out so I've got more points of connection mm -hmm. so I can think about how might my drinking or drug use affect my connection to country or family, spirit, and that kind of thing. Maybe that's enough, Sarah, but, I yeah, just really well done, Matt. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um well, uh, I might kick off with with a question, and it's kind of to both of you. Um, and so it's a little bit about kind of taking a step back from all of these tools and how they're how they're used to, to think about you know what it is that we're trying to do here. Um, Lynette's put into the question that into the Q and A that the app seems very similar to the Grog Drug app that you've been working on, Kylie, um, and it's saying in that it's both in Pinjara and in English. So maybe could you have a crack at explaining to us the difference between <laughs> the two tools and where you might use one and where you might use a, dif a different one. Do you want me to start, Matt, and then yeah, you can absolutely. kind of come in the end? Fill in the gaps. So the, yeah, the Grog app um, and the Drug app. So that's uh, their apps that were co-conceived with um, Professor Scott Wilson, so the CEO of the Aboriginal Drug and Alcohol Council South Australia. So Scott and I co-conceived it. And Scott really wanted a population survey tool to help communities um, better monitor how they were going around drinking and now with drug use as well. We've since morphed that into it being, so that means that we ask about 
demographics. We also ask about consumption, so how much people are using of any drug, including alcohol. But then we ask ICD-11 dependence harms treatment access. We've since morphed that, so we're turning it into a screening tool in primary care. So we've got an MRFF around that. And obviously, we're about to commence a validation study for, for the drug app. But it is, uh, all I would say is that from my perspective, the assist is there as a validated tool to measure dependence. Um, and worse, we are a population survey tool, which is really useful for communities to get a handle on. If I want to look at my community, it's really hard to work out how I'm tracking with, with drinking or drug use, whereas the Grog app will be able to help them do that and it'll actually analyse the data for them and present them with simple infographics so they can go, oh, about 70% of people in my community smoke, they normally use vapes or they normally use rollies and these are some of the harms that they talk about. Whereas MAPS is kind of more um, a diagnostic tool. But over to you, Matt. Yeah, no, yeah, great points, Kylie. And, and it is a good question. Um, essentially... The assist is designed itself, designed to assess a broad spectrum of different problems that a person might be encountering because of their use, you know, problems at home, whether or not, um, you know, all of the ICD-11 and DSM-5 criteria along that sort of spectrum of risk. And sort of that's, it's more intended to, the purpose of the assist is more intended than to connect, use that information to connect to a brief intervention, to to, to leverage off the information that you provide during that screening process to tailor and target a message to you about ways that you can use more safely or reduce your risk if that's what you wanted to do or even just, you know, raise your concern. If, if that's one of the questions in our brief intervention component that, that Kylie's sort of talking about is we've, we've restructured the, the brief intervention around, um, different areas, these interactive elements of firstly, are you concerned about your scores? Is it something that you think is important that you want to address? Because there's no use applying a brief intervention model for cutting down or stopping if if you don't see it as a problem. So there's a bunch of ways that it's different. We see this as a completely complementary tool to what Kylie's doing. We don't see it as a competition. Um, at all. In fact, Kylie is one of the collaborators on our research project as well. So, you know, it, it, this is designed to be, um, can be used by by anyone to assess your, your risk of harm and stratify you into um, a step care approach about what you do. So if it's low risk, you know, great. If it's moderate risk, that brief intervention. If it's higher risk, it's about connecting that person then um, using a sort of brief intervention and motivational style intervention to maybe seek out some some further support if they need to to cut down or stop. Yeah, nice, great answer. Thanks. I know it's it's kind of complicated all these differences between these tools that sort of look the same but actually have quite a different application and the difference yeah. between a screening thing and a diagnostic thing and you know you really get into the weeds. I um. My, I did my PhD on a validation study. So I really, um, I feel for you, like I remember trying to set up all the different tools at the different times and working out how to get the interviews working. It's a, it's no, um, it's no small. It's hard, <laughs> no work. Small. It's hard work. Yeah. It's hard work. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a comment here from another Matt Stevens, um, which I'll just quickly go through uh, just to flag. Um, he said that um, he's found that using tablets to administer surveys in communities so that people can use them themselves is a great idea mm -hmm. and people like to use it and manage it. So that's just really a, a comment. So um, I might just leave that there. But I'll move on to the next question, which was from Maggie Brady, mm -hmm. who said, one of the advantages of brief interventions in primary care with Indigenous clients has been its privacy and the uh, benefits arising from that. And so, Matt, you mentioned that in each of the interviews there will be a translator pre present. Mm -hmm. So she's wondering if, firstly, if you've got enough translators to do this, <laughs> and then also um, if you've had any feedback from any of your cultural advisors about potential difficulties of having this translator present in the interview and how that might impact on the, on privacy. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, so... Great question. We we have several translators that um, are part of this study. We've got, I think, about eight or nine different sites, but about six or seven different researchers that are going to be traveling around, plus a bunch of different translators as well, um, and a, a, enough males and females that we can, and 
so uh, the the interview and the app all of all of that will be gender matched so there won't be any of those kind of um, cross gender issues um sorry what was the second part i completely forgot what that's okay. Um, if you'd have any difficulties with having the translator present in terms of how that might impact on privacy of, we, of participants. Yeah, yeah, we haven't. We ha So like I said, as um, I was presenting, we, we've only um, been out testing the pilot sort of protocol um, so far. We've only um, about four or five assessments have occurred. That hasn't come back as an issue for us, but it's definitely something that um, needs to be managed. The way that we're approaching it is that, the health worker who is known to the, the person will ask them if they want to participate, but then it'll be an independent translator who's not from their family, who doesn't know them, um, who will be, you know, basically involved in that sort of thing. Because there are a lot of sensitivity issues around kin and not wanting to, you know, disclose potentially stigmatized problematic you know substance use information to people who are considered kin so yeah it's it's something that we're aware of and that was um, a big thing in the focus group testing for us but it hasn't come back as an issue so far in in the pilot great thanks um another question here about um about the assist but also to you kylie about the grog survey um, if you've got plans to broaden it out and try it and develop the same methods with other languages and other groups in other parts of the country. Yes, we do. Initially, uh, we wanted to do all of the, we wanted to do Yang Kajara as well and a couple of other languages because I'm based in Adelaide and we have access to the APY lands. Um, we wanted to sort of target the main languages in the APY lands. But when we started this process back in 2018, um, that was the goal, but, you know, then COVID happened and access things happened and all of these things happened and it became really difficult. And these things have their own pace with which they develop. And we just it got to the point where our group, our translator group said to us, look, let's just focus on one language, nail it, and then we can build out from there. So we're definitely going to expand the languages, but we need to validate the English version because we've translated it from from formal English into less formal English and the Pitanjara version. So we're going to be um, trans uh, validating those parts. When we're happy with the English version, we'll use that to, you know, do other languages as well. Have your hands full for a little while there. Don't oh, you? yes, indeed. <laughs> Kylie, you were going to say something just before, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, Sarah, you were asking about the, the Grog app. So it's been designed to add in any number of languages. So I'm actually exploring some work at the moment to even, you know, translate it into other, uh, to have suitability for other culturally, linguistically diverse um, contexts in Australia. Mm -hmm. Because again, there's so much, um, it's just so hard to ask people um, about their drinking or their drug use, and there just aren't enough translators. And we really get that sensitivity issue as well. Mm -hmm. So you can literally just turn it off. So if you wanted to turn off the, the Pitanjara track, then just English would, would appear. Um, I mean, I think both uh, Matt's team and my team are really lucky because we, we have a lot of clinicians, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, on the team. Um, so even when we were recording in the studio with our uh, sound editor, the English tracks are recorded by two, um, you know, uh, amazing Aboriginal drug and alcohol clinicians and a man and a woman, and they very much took it and made it their own. And often they would say, oh, no, it's really important for me to say it this way because that's how I would say it if I was in a, an interview with a, a man or, um, or someone else would do it differently for the women. So, yeah, just um, I think it's really important to to broaden it out, but I'm also really keen um, now we've obviously validated the Grog app um, to look at how you can do it in a bit of an easier way because we have 9,000 audio files alone um, mm -hmm. on on the drug app so and many more images. So it's a lot of work to be translating and back translating. So I think there's a real space for us to use emerging technologies here as well, slowly. Yeah, beautiful. I'm, I'm just um, finishing off a paper that I'm um, about to submit that one of the things that's come up um, when we've been talking to clinicians in rural New South Wales is about how they're using innovative tech to try and improve how they're, how they're delivering services to their clients. And so that really struck a chord with me just looking at 
like the enormous, enormous amount of work behind both both of your tools that you've put into making it um, accessible and um, appropriate and clear. And it's just really so lovely to see research being done so thoughtfully and well. So congratulations to, to both of you. And um, I just really want to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us today and presenting some exciting work. I really look forward to seeing how the validation step goes, Matt. It's, it's a huge undertaking. And it's really exciting to get it to this point where you're just about to kick off. So we'll be, um, we'll be watching closely. So okay. I, I think we're just about at four, so we'll wrap up. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us today. We've got uh, next week's webinar coming up, very exciting. We've got Dr. Nicole Snowden, who many of you will know, presenting to us on the delivery of substance use interventions for young people in rural Australia. So keeping this theme of rural communities and working and looking at young people. So we'll look forward to seeing you all next Thursday at three o'clock. Thanks everyone.